In this class, we will study some concepts related to the schooling of children. The outline of the course includes 1. The importance of education, 2. Education in developing countries, 3. Quantity of education, enrollment, 4. Quality of education, academic performance, 5. School finances, 6. Educational systems, 7. Theoretical frameworks, 8. Estimations, 9. Estimations, quantity of education, 10. Estimations, quality of education, 11. Challenges faced by the educational system, and 12. Policy reforms. This class is structured following Chapter 16 by Paul Glu and Michael Kremer, titled Schools, Teachers, and Educational Outcomes in Developing Countries, from the Handbook of the Economics of Education, Volume 2, 2006. But plenty of literature is made available to complement it. Let us start with the importance of education. It is well known that the great majority of children live in developing countries and that education increases their well-being. Macroeconomists show a positive correlation between education and economic growth in the country. At a micro level, education has also been found to play an important role in increasing income, improving health, reducing fertility, decreasing criminality, reducing child labor, and increasing the adoption of agricultural technologies, amongst others. Although it is possible to observe a large improvement in the number of children enrolled in schools since the 1960s, there is still a significant number of children and adolescents out of school. According to the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, UIS, data, 61 million children from primary school age, 60 million from lower secondary education age, and 142 million from upper secondary school age are out of school, totaling 263 million children and youths that are not attending school. At the upper secondary school age, more than half of youths are out of school in Southern Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Let us look at this graphically. This graph shows the number of children out of school at primary, lower secondary, and upper secondary school ages by gender from 2000 to 2014. We note a significant decline in the number of children out of school at all levels. At the primary school level, more girls are out of school, but at the secondary school level, there are more boys out of school. It is also observed that developing countries have a low quality of schooling. Dropout rates and repeating years are common. There is a lack of basic equipment and supplies in many schools, such as blackboards, chalk, textbooks, desks, computers, and more. Often teachers are absent from classrooms and many students learn a lot less than what is established in the curriculum. Due to a lack of buildings and teachers, schools have ended up adopting large class sizes or shifts, sometimes morning, afternoon, and night, resulting in students having shorter class time. Let us now look at some measurements of education. Gross enrollment rate is defined as the number of children enrolled in a certain level of education, regardless of age, as a percentage of the population in the age group associated with that level. Gross enrollment rate can exceed 100%, and if it does, it does not mean that all school-aged children are in school. The reasons for that are grade repetition or delayed enrollment, resulting in an overage of children enrolled at certain levels, and possibly over-reporting school enrollment by principals and teachers. Net enrollment rate is defined as the number of children enrolled in a certain level of education who are of the age associated with that level of schooling, divided by all the children of the age group associated with that level of schooling. Net enrollment rate can never exceed 100%. Lower rates reflect higher repetition of grades and late school starting age. The following tables present data on gross and net enrollment rates. These tables show primary and secondary schools' gross and net enrollment rates in Sub-Saharan Africa 
East Asia, South Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, North Africa, in 1980 and 2010. In 1980, primary schools gross enrollment rate in Sub-Saharan Africa was 80 percent, while secondary schools gross enrollment rate was only 15 percent. By 2010, it reached 100 percent for primary schools and 36 percent for secondary schools. Although we can observe a progress in children's net enrollment rate in schools from 1980 to 2010, the rates are still low, mainly for secondary schools and in sub-Saharan Africa. These two tables show gender gaps in education through the years in primary and secondary schools and in various regions in 2015. There is a large difference in gross enrollment rates in schools between boys and girls in primary and secondary schools in low-income countries, especially at the secondary school level. Observe that the largest gender gaps are in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East and North Africa. We present here some sources of data on education, such as the World Bank, Our World in Data, OECD countries, and UNESCO. The links are displayed. After discussing quantity of education, let us now look at quality of education. Usually children in low-income countries learn less in school than what is officially established in the curriculum. This low quality of education is explained by a rapid expansion of primary and secondary education in developing countries that resulted in a lack of human resources and financing. Comparisons of students' achievements among different countries uses basically three data sets that are mainly from developed countries but include a few middle-income countries. The first of these three data set is TIMSS or Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study. The TIMSS is an international comparative study that measures trends in mathematics and science achievements at the 4th and 8th grade levels every four years since 1995. The second source of data is PIRLS, or Progress in International Reading Literacy Study. PIRLS is an international comparative assessment that has measured fourth graders' reading levels every five years since 2001. And the third source of data is PISA, Program for International Student Assessment. PISA is managed by the OECD and it measures 15-year-olds' abilities in reading, mathematics, and science every three years since 2000. All OECD member countries participate and some invited countries, such as Albania, Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Croatia, Indonesia, Jordan, Kosovo, Lebanon, Morocco, Panama, Peru, the Philippines, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Uruguay, and Vietnam, etc. This table shows the scores and the country's ranks for the TIMSS and PISA exams in mathematics. Observe that Singapore, some areas of China, Hong Kong, and Japan have among the highest scores in both tests. On the other hand, countries in Africa, South and Central America, as well as the Middle East, have among the lowest scores. Regarding participation, it is clarified by TIMSS that countries and benchmarking participants could choose to participate in the 4th grade assessment, the 8th grade assessment, or both. In 2019, 58 countries and 6 benchmarking entities participated in the TIMSS 4th grade assessment, and 39 countries and 7 benchmarking participants participated in the 8th grade assessment. International student achievement tests often exclude developing countries. However, these countries have the most potential to gain from human capital accumulation. Patrinos and Agrist, 2018, harmonized learning outcomes that included many developing countries. Similarly, Patel and Sandefur, 2020, developed a methodology to link scores from different populations and called it the Rosetta Stone for human capital. We can infer that students in primary and secondary schools learn less in most developing countries compared to students in developed countries. 
The differences in scores may reflect socioeconomic characteristics that differ among families, but also characterize a low school quality in developing countries. Government expenditures on education as a percentage of GDP can be an important factor differentiating students' achievements in poor and rich countries. Let us see the differences among regions in the next table. This table shows government expenditures on education as a percentage of GDP. As poorer countries have lower GDPs per capita, this translates into lower budgets per capita or per student. Although high-income countries spend more than low-income and middle-income countries, the differences are not so remarkable. The largest component of government expenditures on education are the teachers' salaries. Observe in this table that all staff compensation as a percentage of total expenditure in public institutions in 2015 reached more than 70% in Mexico, Uruguay, Afghanistan, Argentina, and many other countries. Although a large share of the expenditures are allocated to teachers' salaries, which doesn't mean higher amounts, the proportion of qualified teachers is lower in low-income countries, with the smallest percentage in sub-Saharan Africa, where only 78% of secondary school teachers are qualified in 2015, according to the World Bank Education Statistics. Another clear difference between rich and poor countries is the pupil-teacher ratio, which is a lot higher in low-income countries, and again, sub-Saharan Africa has the highest value of 47 to 1 in primary schools in 2015. This table shows the pupil-teacher ratio in primary schools for different regions. Other differences between rich and poor countries are the school systems are highly centralized and have weak teachers' incentives in developing countries. The teachers' unions are strong. The teachers have little supervision and absence rates are high. There is a lack of teacher accountability. We will now look at a methodological framework to better understand the causal relationships underlying educational outcomes and to recommend policies based on the estimates of these causal relationships. Following Glue and Kremer, 2006, we will assume that each household, usually the parents, will maximize a utility function subject to constraints. The production function for learning can be represented by A as a function of S, Q, C, H, and I, where A is achievements or skills learned, S is the years of schooling, Q is a vector of schools and teachers' characteristics, C is a vector of children's characteristics, including innate abilities. H is a vector of household characteristics, parental educational levels, for instance. And I is a vector of educational inputs under the control of parents, for example, textbooks, school attendance, school supplies, etc. Consider C and H as exogenous and I as endogenous, and let P be the vector of prices related to schooling, such as school fees, prices for school supplies, and wages paid for child labor. The effects of the vector of prices P works through S and I, but has no effect on learning, and because of that does not appear in equation 1. Assume also that all variables in Q and P are exogenous to the household, which implies that parents cannot choose from more than one school or that only one school is available. Parents will then choose S and I to maximize the utility function subject to constraints. Then years of schooling S and educational inputs I can be set as functions of exogenous variables, such as S as a function of Q, C, H, and P, and I as a function of Q, C, H, and P. Substituting 2 and 3 into 1 yields the reduced form equation for A, which is a function of Q, C, H, and P. If we assume that households can choose from more than one school, which is more realistic, then Q and P become endogenous, Households will then maximize utility with respect to each schooling choice, choosing the one that gives the highest utility. Conditional on this specific school, 
households choose S and I as if there was only one school choice. Observe that 4 is a causal relationship and reflects preferences. If policymakers want to know the impact of policies on years of schooling, S, or learning, A, we can use equations 2 and 4. For example, class size reduction is an element of Q, and altering tuition fees is related to changing one component of P. Equation 1 shows how changes in QI, which is an element of Q, affect A, keeping all other variables constant and therefore giving the partial derivative of A with respect to QI. On the other hand, equation 4 provides the total derivative of A with respect to QI, as it allows for changes in S and I. Although equation 4 gives a more direct answer to policymakers as it shows what happens to academic achievements, A, after a change in one element of Q or P, equation 1 may also be important as it captures overall welfare effects, not accounting for changes in S and I. We can also study educational policies, EP, that, instead of directly changing P and Q, change the way schools are organized, such as incentives to teachers based on students' performances. Local community characteristics, L, may interact with educational policies to determine the quality of a school and possibly the price of educational inputs. We can then write Q as a function of L and EP, and P as a function of L and EP, and substitute these equations, 5 and 6, into 2 and 4 to get the reduced form of S as a function of C, H, L, and E, P, as well as the reduced form of A as a function of C, H, L, and E, P. Based on these equations, policymakers would be able to measure policies' impacts on the main outcomes of interest. This methodological framework has two limitations. It does not consider bargaining among members of the household and it does not consider the general equilibrium effects of educational policies. Estimations of equations 1, 2, 4, 7, and 8 to analyze the determinants of years of schooling and learning are usually done using retrospective data. Assuming Q and P are exogenous, and since C and H are also exogenous, one could estimate the equations by ordinary least squares, OLS, to obtain unbiased estimates of the parameters associated with each variable. However, in using OLS, we may incur estimation problems. Some variables that are not observed, such as a child's innate ability and motivation, C, a parent's willingness and capacity to help their children, H, a teacher's skills and motivation, and a school principal's management capacity, Q, may cause omitted variable bias in the OLS estimates. There may be measurement errors in observed explanatory variables that can lead to biases. And endogenous program placement bias may be evident. For example, with governments that provide better schools or school inputs in areas without educational problems. Therefore, just using OLS to estimate the impact of variables on educational outcomes may often result in biased estimates. Natural experiments and randomized trials may be used to solve the estimation problems. In natural experiments, it may be possible to use instrumental variables, although it is not easy to find such variables as they must be correlated with the observed variables that are not orthogonal to the error term, but uncorrelated with the error term. The instrumental variable approaches estimate local average treatment effects, which are the effects on individuals whose participation in the treatment was highly influenced by the instrumental variable. A better approach to circumvent these estimation problems is to use randomized trials, which consists of randomly dividing a sample into two groups, the treatment group and the comparison group. These groups should have no systematic differences other than the treatment, and under certain assumptions, unbiased estimates of the effect of the treatment are obtained 
which calculate the differences in the outcome variables across the two groups. This figure, taken from a book by Gertler et al., 2011, gives us an example of a randomized offering of the program in the final enrollment. For more details on the method, please consult this bibliography. Randomized evaluations estimate partial equilibrium treatment effects. The advantage of the randomized evaluations over other techniques is that observed and unobserved characteristics are uncorrelated in expectations with the treatment due to the random assignment of observations. Also, if well implemented, measurement errors should not be a problem. However, problems of selection and attrition bias remain. So far, we have considered the quantity of schooling, S, as years of completed schooling. However, researchers in practice may use measures of completion of a given level of schooling, their current education, or the decision to drop out or continue to the next grade. Both are imperfect measures of years of schooling completed. A measurement issue in this case may occur because many children in the cross-sectional data have not completed their entire education and therefore years of completed school are censored. On the other hand, if the data is collected for older individuals who had completed school, his or her school and household characteristics are not historical and there is a large time difference between the data collected and the period of his or her education. In this case, to minimize the problem, we assume small changes in the school characteristics through the years. Also, a student's attendance can be erratic, and it is difficult to know if the student was frequently absent or if he or she has dropped out of school. We will now analyze policies that change school and teacher characteristics, Q, or the prices of educational inputs, P, or both. Characteristics of schools and teachers that can be improved are textbooks, blackboards, and other physical supplies, as well as better trained teachers, smaller class sizes, and or providing school repairs. The next slides show studies that measure the impact of Q and or P on the quantity of education, and then on the quality of education. Starting with the impact on the quantity of education, the following studies tried to estimate equation two. Several studies compare policies focused on building new schools and therefore reducing travel time with policies focused on improving the quality of existing schools. We look now at studies analyzing the determinants of completed years of schooling using retrospective data. Glue and Jacoby, 1994, studied the impact of distance to schools and school quality on years of schooling for individuals from 11 to 20 years of age in Ghana using data collected in 1988 to 1989. The results showed that years of completed schooling increased by increasing the number of qualified teachers, repairing leaking roofs, reducing travel time, and or providing blackboards when non-existent. Their analysis may suffer from omitted variable bias, as schools can differ in many other ways than considered by the available variables. Also, there may be measurement errors in variables if they change significantly over time, contradicting the assumption that school characteristics have changed little during the decades. Measurement errors may also appear in collecting the data. Baumier and Lambert, 2000, observed that in Tanzania, long distances to schools negatively affect years of schooling, while quality of Swahili teaching had a positive effect on years of schooling. However, there are measurement errors in the variables. For example, more than 100 kilometers was reported as the distance to the nearest primary school. Also, there were possibly omitted variables bias since they considered only four school quality variables. We now look at studies analyzing the determinants of completed years of schooling using natural experiments. Dufflow, 2001, estimated the impact of building schools on years of schooling attained in Indonesia. She took advantage of a government policy of building new schools in 1973 
and concluded that the policy was effective in increasing the number of years of education completed. The identification was based on the fact that cohorts participating in the program were easily identified. In this case, individuals 12 years old or older did not participate in the program when the program started. Similarly, Chin, 2002, estimated the impact of placing additional teachers in primary schools on education completed in India, finding positive results for girls. Identification was also based on the fact that the cohorts participating in the program were easily identified. We now look at studies using randomized evaluations. Banerjee et al. 2000 observed that additional teachers, mainly female, increased girls' school participation in India. Glu et al. 2006, studying programs focused on school quality, textbooks in Kenya, found almost no effect on school participation. In many developing countries, parents face difficulties in providing school inputs as well as paying fees. Reducing the school costs has had a high impact on school participation. School costs are school fees, uniforms, textbooks, materials, transportation, etc. Some showed that providing textbooks and uniforms or eliminating school fees generated a large positive enrollment response. Kremer, Moulin, and Nemanu, 2002. Lacey, 2003, showed that decreasing school fees in Kenya increases students' enrollments. Instead of reducing school fees, government programs can provide cash grants to families to enroll and keep their children in school. Mexico's social program Prospera and Brazil's social program Bolsa Familia are the largest conditional cash transfer programs in the world. Provide stipends to families with children and adolescents conditional on their school attendance and family participation in health measures, for example, vaccinations, prenatal care, etc. Schultz, 2004, found a positive impact of the program on school outcomes in Mexico, and Glu and Kasuf, 2011, found this in Brazil as well. There are other programs that provide school meals, which attract children to schools and increase their academic performance by improving their nutritional status. Vermeersch and Kremer, 2004, found an increase in preschool participation in Kenya when school meals were being provided to children. Knowing that poor health affects school participation, some studies evaluated the effect of deworming drugs on the quantity of schooling. Miguel and Kramer, 2004, observed that deworming drugs increased child health and increased primary school participation in Kenya. Due to reduced disease transmission, untreated students also benefited. That is, there was a positive externality. Babonis et al., 2004, found improvements in preschool attendance in urban areas of India with the implementation of health programs. Let us now look at gender differences in schools. Evidence suggests that the elasticity of demand for schooling is larger for girls than for boys. Therefore, programs and policies to increase children's education may be more effective for girls than for boys. Some studies that confirm this hypothesis are Chin, 2002, and Drez and Kinden, 2001, in India, and Schultz, 2004 and Morley and Cody, 2003, in Mexico. A study by Banerjee et al., 2000, showed that having a female teacher increased girls' school attendance in India. Kremer, Miguel, and Thornton, 2004, studied a scholarship program for girls in rural Kenya, concluding that it increased their school attendance rates. We now present studies that investigate the factors affecting quality of education, estimating equations 1, 4, or both. With an increase in school enrollment in many developing countries since the 1960s and 70s, attention was brought to another important factor of development and growth, which is the quality of education. 
A large number of studies tried to identify the impact of school and teachers' characteristics on students' performance on academic tests. Hanushek, 1995, reviewed 96 studies in developing countries to explain students' school performance and found little empirical evidence that the teacher-pupil ratio, the teacher's level of education, the teacher's teaching experience, the teacher's salary, and expenditures per pupil increased students' test scores. However, since these studies use retrospective data and are not randomized trials, there may be an omitted variable bias in the estimates. Potential sources of bias are 1. Unobserved variables, such as the child's innate ability and motivation, as well as the parental interest in education. Children with high ability tend to enroll in high-quality schools, creating positive correlation and resulting in upward bias estimates in the analysis. 2. Omitted school and teacher quality of variables, such as a teacher's motivation. 3. Sample selection bias if parents choose the schools their children attend. 4. Measurement errors in the regressors. 5. Endogenous program placement which may happen if, for example, governments construct schools or assign resources to schools based on unobserved district characteristics. We now analyze studies that use natural experiments to examine how school characteristics impact students' learning. Agrist and Lavi, 1999, used the Mamanides rule as an instrumental variable to study the effect of class sizes on students' performance in schools. This rule, used in Israeli schools, establishes that class sizes cannot exceed 40 students, and when enrollment reaches 41, class sizes must be split into two. With this rule, class sizes vary monotonically, with total enrollment in a specific grade generating a credible instrumental variable for class size that would otherwise be correlated with unobserved determinants of student learning. The authors find negative effects of large class sizes on reading and mathematics scores of fifth graders. The following studies used randomized evaluations to analyze factors affecting quality of education. Glu, Kremer, and Moulin, 2006, found no evidence of an impact on student scores in Kenyan schools with the government provision of textbooks. In another study by Glu et al., 2004, randomly selected primary schools in Kenya received flip charts. The results showed no effect on students' test scores. Banerjee et al., 2005, analyzed a remedial education program in some districts of urban India. The program consisted of hiring young women from the community to teach basic literacy and numeracy skills to children in third and fourth grades. They found improvements in test scores as a result and at a low cost. In the same study, Banerjee et al. 2005 implemented a randomized evaluation of a computer-assisted learning program, CAL, C -A -L, in schools in India. The CAL was based on a government program that donated four computers to each municipal primary school in some districts of India. They found significant improvements in students' learning and concluded that the use of computers is important in improving learning when the quality of teachers is poor. It seems that the most effective policy for improving learning in developing countries is through providing inputs that tackle the problem of weak teaching. On the other hand, programs that provided inputs that were dependent on use by the teachers, for example, flip charts or textbooks, were less effective. We now list and discuss the main challenges faced by the education systems in developing countries. The first one is that resources for education are diverted to other purposes. Reinecke and Svensson, 2004, concluded that only 13% of the grants that were supposed to cover schools' non-wage expenditures in Uganda reached the schools. The authors argue that the grants were possibly used to finance the local political machinery. The largest percentage of educational spending is on teachers' salaries. However, many times they are absent from their classrooms. Chowhiri et al., 2008, 
2006 showed that close to 20% of the teachers were absent from their classrooms when surprise visits were made to primary schools in Bangladesh, Ecuador, India, Indonesia, Peru, and Uganda. Kremer et al., 2006, showed that absence rates are higher in poor regions of India. Often funds directed to educational inputs such as textbooks, uniforms, chalk, etc., never reach the students or the teachers. The second problem is that in many developing countries, funds may be inefficiently allocated, such as very large percentages going to cover teachers' salaries. Pritchett and Filmer, 1999, claim that policymakers provide rents to teachers instead of allocating inputs efficiently. A third issue is that educational systems are elite-oriented, and the curriculum is not appropriate for the typical child. Also, in many developing countries, per-pupil expenditure is much higher for tertiary students than for primary and secondary students. According to Glu and Kremer, 2006, in less developed countries, there is a much higher heterogeneity among students and teachers in enrollment, attendance, teacher absences, and educational backgrounds, which results in difficulties in creating a single curriculum appropriate for the whole population. Many educational policies try to improve quantity or quality of education through incentives for teachers and financing arrangements. In this case, the impacts are analyzed by estimating equations 7 and 8. Let us look at teachers' incentives as the first policy reform to reduce distance and inefficiencies in the institutional arrangements of the educational systems. Some researchers suggest that a teacher's pay should be linked to students' performance. Others think that linking a teacher's pay to students' performance would destroy the students' creativity and curiosity as all the teaching would be focused on the standardized tests. Empirical evidence on the efficacy of monetary teacher incentives is not abundant. Lavi, 2002, found positive effects on students' outcomes in Israel. However, Glu, Ilias, and Kremer, 2004, found no important results in Kenya. The second possible policy reform is through decentralization and local community participation. Failures are observed in centralized school systems. Due to that, many observers suggest decentralization and community participation. They claim that locals have a better knowledge of the children's needs and that more incentives to monitor teachers' performances and appropriate use of school funds will also help. Jimenez and Zawada 1999, studied the EDUCO program in El Salvador. This program focuses on decentralization, where school committees are responsible for hiring and firing teachers, as well as equipping and maintaining the schools appropriately. The authors found positive results in increasing enrollments in rural areas. Rainika and Svensson, 2003, analyzed the impact of local community empowerment in Uganda on delivery of funds to schools by the central government, and they found a highly significant increase in funds that reached the schools. Carnado et al., 2015, used a randomized trial to examine the impact of a school grants program in Senegal. Under this program, elementary schools could apply for funds to develop a project with the objective of improving the quality of learning and teaching. They found large positive effects on test scores at lower grades. The final policy reform we look at is the vouchers and school choice programs. In this program, students receive government funds to enroll in public or private schools. Vouchers were highly implemented in Chile and Colombia in the 1980s. Colombia's voucher program offered vouchers to more than 125,000 poor students to enroll in private schools. Since the demand for vouchers was high, the distribution of vouchers to students was based on a lottery. Agrist et al., 2002, took advantage of this natural experiment to study the impact of the program on school outcomes and found positive results in students completing grades and increasing their test scores. The reason for this could be that more students attended private schools, which are better than public schools.
Also, if students failed a grade, they could lose the voucher, which resulted in more efforts from the students and the schools. The program in Chile doubled the number of pupils in private schools over 20 years. Shea in Orkiola, 2002, analyzed the impact of the voucher program in Chile and did not find positive effects on educational outcomes. They concluded that the program increased the choices of schools but did not add value to the education received. However, we must carefully analyze the results, as Glu and Kremer, 2006, raised many estimation problems.